Uh, I'm excited to share this word with you about being anxious for nothing this morning. Turn to Philippians chapter 4, if you will. Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse verse 4. And if you would, uh, stand for the reading of the word. If you don't have your Bible, she should, should put it on the screen up here for you. Father, we thank you and we praise you that your word is powerful, living, sharper than a two-edged sword. And we feed on it. We don't feed on on bread. We feed on your word. The bread comes because we feed on your word. And we live on it and we make it part of our life. And when we do that, what happens is, is we enter into that place of blessing. We enter into that place, that sweet spot in your will, where everything that we do, God, brings forth fruit for your kingdom. And we thank you. We thank you for that, God. And we pray that you anoint this word, anoint it with your spirit, where it comes into our spirit. It mingles with our spirit. It begins to bear fruit in us. And we learn how it is to, that we are never anxious for anything. We learn how to walk in that peace. And I just ask you to anoint it, God. Work it for our good in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. For the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And may the God of peace also be with you. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word you may be seated. I think it's helpful as soon as we come to this understanding about our relationship with our creator. And this is an important thing. The important thing is this. We were created to be self-sufficient. We were never made to be self-sufficient. God has designed us to have a deep longing in our hearts for something. And that something that we long for is for Him. We were designed to need Him. Not just in our daily bread, but in every area of our life. We were designed to be to where we have to have God to get along. And this is the danger of riches without first establishing a real relationship. You know, for every 10 men who can withstand adversity, there's only one in that same group. I'm telling you, this is a ministerial truth. I've seen this over and over again. For every 10 men that can withstand great adversity, there's only one in that group that can withstand prosperity. Prosperity has destroyed more men than adversity has. I promise you. And what happens is, is when you have riches come without first establishing the relationship then you get in this dilemma of the rich young ruler. If you want to turn to Mark chapter 10, I want, to, I want to talk about Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but I want to kind of give you a highlight. I want you to take it home, and I want you to study it and pray and get God to show you uh, some truth that might apply to your life. This is a man who comes to Jesus, and he says, Lord, what do I got to do to get into heaven? And he says to him, because he hadn't established, he hadn't gone across yet, so there's no new covenant yet. He says, well, you know the terms of the covenant. You have to, you have to not commit adultery. You have to uh, honor your mild father. And he lists the Ten Commandments. You have to do it. He said, those things I have done from my childhood. And God said, great. And then he looked at him, and the word says that he loved him. And he said, one more thing that you have to do. One more thing that you have to do. You have to sell all your stuff and give it to the poor. Oh, you could have knocked this guy over with a feather. That wasn't what he was expecting to hear. Because he grew up in a culture that told you that whenever you were rich, it meant that you were righteous. That if you were poor and broke, it meant that you were a sinner. That if you were living the way God called you to live, that you were definitely, definitely going to be free. And the more prosperous you were, then the more righteous you must be. That was the culture. And for him to say that all of this wealth that you've accumulated because you think you're righteous. <laughs> oh, I hate hanging around people that think they're righteous. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. 
All this wealth you've accumulated, you've got to sell that and you've got to give it to the poor. And then you've got to take up your cross and you've got to follow me. And that's how you'll get into the kingdom of heaven. The word says he was downcast and he turned because he had great wealth. And he couldn't do it. And the disciples said, hey, wait a minute. We never heard you preach that message before. See, they joined up with Jesus because they thought he was the Messiah, the king. You know what that meant? That meant that if you were in a close contact with the Messiah, you were in a place of great political leadership, that means you're going to have riches. That means you're going to be an influential guy. That means that you're going to be uh, you're going to be in the cabinet of the king and you're going to have little kingdoms that are going to be yours. And you're going to, What about that God? I don't understand that. You told that rich guy that he had to give everything away. You never said anything to us. What about us, God? We've given away. We've left our farms. We've left our businesses. We've left our homes. We've left all of our stuff and we've come to follow you and and this is where he had to read between the lines because we thought we were going to get more stuff. And Jesus said to him, I'll tell you the truth, it's harder for a rich man who trusts in riches. You had to watch that. There is nowhere you will ever find Jesus say there is anything wrong with being wealthy. In fact, part of the covenant is, is you're called to be wealthy, influential, successful. But he said the man who trusts in his riches... Is impossible for it's easier to get an eye, a camel stuffed through the eye of a needle than it is for him to get into the kingdom of heaven. And that's when they went. What are you saying? Here's what he's saying: Great wealth comes with a strong sense of self-sufficiency. You know, I'll tell you the truth. God's put me in a very unusual, unusual position. I, I have gotten to know and work for men, even be in business with men that have vast, vast wealth. Uh, I was in the construction business when I was a young man and I got a job as an overseer on a big contract, big construction project with a man who from Houston, Texas, who had the largest, he was the head of the largest privately owned mortgage company in the world. He owned it. FDIC didn't come audit him because he didn't borrow no money from them. It was all his money. And he had this big, he had this big high rise building in downtown Houston and he had a heliport on the top and he had a he had a ship in the dock at Galveston that slept 140 something people and he would fly you know, the helicopter back and forth from the ship to his deal he would show it was interesting when he came up here to the Texas Panhandle to check on the jobs with his with his with his executive staff you know you could always tell if he was with them because he would rent a, a little little Ford four-door car, you know, at the airport. When they came without him, man, they rented a Lincoln. I mean, you know, I could always tell that he was, so he was real kind of a conservative guy. He wasn't a flamboyant guy. He loved the ocean. You know, you can say, well, hey, if you've got a ship that sleeps 147 people, you're kind of flamboyant. But he just loved the ocean and he had the money. My point in, that I want to say is, is that what I noticed about this guy is, I've, I've used this before, but, but he wore glasses. He's like me. He wore them, you know, to see off and he didn't read with them. And I noticed that his glasses, the earpieces, were chewed completely off on him. I guess that's why I'm in ministry. I notice things about people. And I noticed that he was, he seemed like he was really, man, had it together. I mean, you know, like no problems in the world. I mean, what are you, what are you going to have no problem? Well, you got a, you got a ship that's got a crew. What, you know, what problems could you have, you know? I found out later as I worked for him that he had huge huge, huge financial problems. And that his people that worked for him worked for him because he was rich. And they really didn't care one whit about him. And I'll tell you the truth, he gave me a job when we were starving in the construction business. I had five framing crews. He put us all to work. We built 90 houses. We built 30 houses in 90 days because we were starving. I didn't have any trouble getting a sheetrocker to come on that job. They would leave the yard when the load of sheetrock left the lumber yard. Sheetrockers would follow it. When they started unloading it, they'd start hanging the sheetrock and hoping that I would pay them for it. They didn't even have the job. That's how that's how hungry we were in the construction business. And and I appreciated it very much. But as I got to know him, and he sort of opened up to me, and kind of, you know, I kind of got to know him a little bit. And, it, and he, and in the fact, he, he asked me to come to Houston and run a big job there. And he flew me up there. He says, "I'm doing, I'm going to do 7,500 houses here in Houston. I want you to come run this job." And anyway, 
My point is, is he had lots of money, he had lots of power, he had lots of influence, but what he didn't have is he didn't have any peace. Come on, somebody. There was no peace in this man's life. Why he loved, what I learned later, is the reason he loved the ocean so much, he could get away from everything. He had to get away from the storm to survive the storm. Now here's what I'm here to tell you the difference between you and him. You can be in the storm and still have peace. Come on, somebody. You can be in the center of the storm. You don't gotta, you don't gotta go buy an ocean liner and go halfway around the world to get out in the middle of nowhere where nobody can bother you to get peace. You can have it right in the midst of the circumstance that you're in because of the relationship that you have with Jesus. Amen. Wealth does not breed a spiritual life. What it does is it kills the spiritual life because you have this strong sense of self-sufficiency and you were created to be wholly dependent on Him. Amen. In every... Dependent for what? Everything. Your relationships, your money, your peace, your joy, your kids, your health. You were created to be totally dependent on Him. His riches make a perfect fit for our needs. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God has the resources, people. He has the resources. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. That's what it says in Psalms. He has everything that you need. Now, there's, 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 if you're not walking in that provision, then there could be some reasons. And I want to go over uh, four reasons why perhaps you're not appropriating what God has for you. Number one, you haven't asked. James 4, 2. You have not because you asked not. This is an incredible thing. When you get this religious thing about money, when you get religious about money, what well, you know, you got to be poor to be spiritual. Uh, you see this in uh, my brothers and sisters that come out of the Catholic Church. How many of y'all have come out of the Catholic Church in this? I love you. I want you to know. I love Catholics. I love them. I love them because they have a heart of devotion. They really love God. But you have been taught that money is evil. And that the more of it you have, the less spiritual you are. Because you have not taught, been taught that it's the trusting in money. It's the trusting in riches is what gets you in trouble. God wants you to have wealth. He wants you to steward it for Him. But He wants you to be totally dependent on Him. One of the ways He can tell is what you do with it when you get it. Do you bring an offering to the church? Or do you go, oh no, I can't do that, man. I've got, you know, I've got to buy a new piece of equipment. How do you handle your money? That will tell God where your heart is. But people who have been in a religious kind of an environment about money are scared to ask God for financial provision. They think that makes them weak or they have too much pride to ask or whatever reason. Number one reason, people do not walk in the provision that God has. His, his riches fit our needs perfectly. Why are they not walking in it? They don't ask. They fail to ask. Number two, when they ask, they ask amiss. James 4, 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now, I'm here to tell you something. God is not upset because you take money and take your wife to Hawaii on a vacation. That's not, that's not, that's wonderful. He's not, a, that's not what I'm talking about, what we're talking about here. What he's talking about here is this, you haven't been crucified yet. You haven't given God everything in your life yet. You still, it's still about you. It's still about you. You know, I want to tell you the truth. This, this, I can, I can be really honest, and I still got some areas where I make it about me. I'm a work in progress. That's what Carol tells me. I am a work in progress. I've still got some areas that I'm selfish in, but I want to tell you this. You know why I want to be successful in the horse business? Because it will bring Jesus Christ glory. Everybody knows how I got in the horse business. I got in the horse business to a Tarim offering that I made the Lord. He put me in the horse business, and I got some of the best mares I've ever had in my life. We have had we had a, sold a cult to a woman from Sweden, and she showed the cult in the fraternity this year. And all of that, I don't say that to brag on me. I say that to brag on the covenant. Jesus Christ is how we got there, not by us, our skill. And I want to be successful to bring Him glory. Now, the minute that I make it about me, Come on, somebody. Now I've stepped over that line and I'm making it about, he said, you ask amiss because you ask because you want, you, you making it about you. This is what James 4, 3 says. If you want to be successful in business to bring glory to God, to provide for his church, to provide for his people, there is nothing that God will not supply. If you're humble, we ask amiss. We haven't asked or we ask amiss. Number three, we've been, we were willfully disobedient. 
1 Samuel 15, 23 says this. It says that God prefers obedience to sacrifice and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. If you have been willfully disobedient, <laughs> and I have, I'm telling you, it's no place to be. You talk about grace drying up in your life. When you get willfully disobedient to what God has asked you to do, don't expect to walk in the glory of his provision. And here's the, this is an easy thing to take care of. You don't need to take care of willful disobedience. You just do what God told you to do. That grace is restored the minute you do exactly what he told you to do. But I promise you can't think that you're going to be, you know, I see people and like they want God to bless them financially. And yet they, they have never, ever, ever, ever. They, when they, the, you know, I hear people, <laughs> uh, Rodney says this all the time. I think this is pretty funny. People go buy a lottery ticket. They say, God, if you'll cut me on this million, I'll be sure to tithe. I'll tithe, I'll tithe the hundred thousand to you. God, just, just, just let me win the million. And the Lord says, you won't tithe on a hundred dollars. You're sure not going to tithe on a million dollars. Amen. There's a lot of truth in that. When you show God that you're totally confident in him and his provision, then you know that you are not self-sufficient and you're never going to be self-sufficient. That you'll always have to depend on him. It ain't hard to bring him an offering. Amen. When you demonstrated your commitment to be obedient to his word, then you walk into provision. Number four, you haven't admitted that you're dependent on him. This is the biggest one, I think. First Peter 5, 5 says that God gives humility to the humble, but he resists the proud. You know, when I keep thinking, you know what, I don't need God. I got this God. I don't need it. I don't need help. I can do this. That's when I'm in real trouble. But the minute I come to God and say, God, I can't make it without you, that's when he releases grace in my life. Four reasons you may not be walking in God's provision. You haven't asked. You ask amiss. You're willfully disobedient. Or you just refuse to admit to God that you have to be dependent on Him. Now God's heart is to bless His people. Psalm 35, 27 says, The Lord's magnified and He has pleasure in the prosperity of His servant. The cattle on a thousand hills all belong to Him. He wants to provide the resources to us. The danger we get into is when we begin to seek security from our possessions, though. Matthew 6, 31 and 34. Don't worry about it. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your Heavenly Father knows what you need them. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things, and that shall be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. The cares of the world choke the word out and they make it of no effect, Jesus taught. Worry kills the spiritual life. Listen to me. Worry kills the spiritual life. And the more you worry, the more your spiritual nature evaporates and becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. This is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. This is really interesting. He said, to seek security from your possessions is like trying to drive out care with more care. The net result is precisely the opposite of what you anticipate. What happens when we begin to either worry about finances or we begin to worship the provision that God has given us? Is that we're trying to drive out care with more care. I got that way with my horses there at one time. I mean, I had a run of tough luck. We lost some mares and had called, you know, just had a lot of things that we were, it wasn't luck, I, I, but it was just, it was a challenge to see if we could stand on the word and believe in God and and all of those things and and uh, things you know weren't going well and I was worrying about it and I was trying to make it happen and the Lord just quickened me one time he said I didn't give you the horses to worry about I gave them to you to bless you you're turning them into you're trying to worry make them into your provision I never told you they were going to be your provision you understand what I'm saying yeah. is this making sense to you I gave it to you, gave it to you to take care of. You've done a good job. You've took care of them the best you could. Continue. I'll guarantee you this, they're not going to break you because I'm in it with you. 
But the minute that I begin to look for them for provision, guess what happens? I'm just turned, trying to drive out care with more care. I'm not walking up and not worrying about my provision. I'm All of a sudden, I become preoccupied with the possessions that God has given me, looking to them to provide for me. This is why when, when Abraham put Isaac on the altar, the kid that God blessed him with, and he said, take him to the altar and sacrifice him. And Abraham drew the knife back and God stayed his hand. Okay, you've proven to me that you won't worship the blessing, but you'll worship the blessor. And if you'll follow that, the next chapter, God fulfills his covenant with Abraham. You've proven to me that you're qualified to be multiplied because you know, I can trust you with it. If I give it to you, when I give you all this land, when I give you all them sheep, when I give you all them goats, I don't know whether that's a blessing or not. Rodney says, hey, that's not a blessing, amen. <laughs> when I give you all of this wealth, you're not going to worship it. You're going to worship me because you put your own son, who was the original blessing, you put him on the altar. You prove to me. See, I think this morning, I think that there's someone in here and there's something that you're packing around and, you're, and it's not working and God blessed you with it and I think you just need to put it on the altar. And take your hands off of it. And say, God, I won't worship. I ain't going to worship the blessing anymore. I'm going to worship the one that blessed me. That's right. Our stock and trade in financial provision is Colossians 2, 2, and 3. Attaining all riches and the fullness and assurance of understanding and the knowledge to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of His Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Who was the smartest man who ever lived? No, let me, let me ask this. Who was the most moral man who ever lived? Jesus. Non-believers will tell you Jesus Christ. I mean, that, 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 he had a great reputation. Who was the smartest man who ever lived? Most of them say Albert Einstein. The smartest man who have ever walked the face of this earth was Jesus Christ. He had all the knowledge of all the mysteries, understood how everything worked. He didn't spend a lot of time trying to explain it to us because we knew we didn't have the mental capacity to comprehend it. But when you tap into a life, a spiritual life in Christ, and you have a real problem, and you're trying to look for a solution, go to Him. Trust in Him for the knowledge. This is what I tell my youth that are about to go to college. They're going to try to steal your faith. But you remember this. He is the source of all wisdom and all knowledge. The knowledge that they've acquired, they've acquired through the traditions of men and the philosophies of man. And it will go so far, and that's as far as it will go. God will unlock the mysteries of the universe to you if you seek Him for wisdom and knowledge. Now, I know for a fact, there's been years... When Bill, in fact, Jim and I were talking about this. He told this story about you. Their dad had passed away, and Bill was farming on his own, and it was a it was a kind of a tough year. And they had lots of beets in the field. And the sugar content wasn't very good. Now, if you know anything about beets, you gotta let those things kind of age in the field, you know? To get the sugar content. You get paid for the sugar, so you take a big discount if you harvest them to her. Bill called his brother and he said, man, I've been praying. And I've been thinking maybe I need to go ahead and get them harvested. What do you think? He said, man, I trust you. You pray. And that's what God shows you. That's what you need to do. Well, it made no sense. All the other farmers around him go, that nut. He's out there. Them beats ain't going to bring nothing. Well, guess what? After he got all his beats dug, I think you had like one small patch left. It started raining. And it started freezing. And it started, the weather started turning bad. And the rest of those guys' beets rotted in the field. And that was the last year Holly Sugar was in business. They closed down the next year. Sister White remembers. She's shaking her head. You remember well, don't you? Those beets absolutely ruined in the field. And they made nobody nothing. The only guy that got any income off his beets was Bill. And he was doing the opposite of the conventional wisdom. Because God said, I want you to do it. Jim tells that story. He says every time you call him and ask him for advice about something, he says, just do whatever God's showing you, man. It's working. It ain't so. Oh. 
See, this is where you come into financial progress is when you are so obedient that you're willing to do something that's totally against your natural reasoning mind just because God says to do it. All wisdom and knowledge and truth is hidden in Christ. He knows everything. When we follow Him, we prosper. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Peace, how do we get it? We entrust all of our outcomes to Him. Man, I have a lot of people come to me and say, I need peace. And here's, this is where you get it. You entrust all of your outcomes to Him. What are you dealing with this morning? You're dealing with some things. Some are big giants. But you get peace when you entrust all of your outcomes to God. Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That means it doesn't look, why would you be peaceful about this? This looks crazy, but yet you have peace. You're in the middle of the storm. You don't got to get on a ship and go down to the coast of El Mexico and fish to get peace. You can be in peace right in the middle of the storm because you trust the one who said, you're not self-sufficient. Depend on me. And this is what he told. This is what he told Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Now that's a word for somebody in here this morning. God is saying to you, "My grace is sufficient for you. Trust me. Entrust your outcomes to me. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. You've been there, haven't you, Jessica? Remember that day we prayed in the emergency room, and your husband was bad sick. Bad sick." And we entrusted that outcome totally to God. And look at him now. He just walks around at will. <laughs> <laughs> he gets tired of my messages. He just goes out and takes a break. He comes back. But thank God his wife is listening because she's the one that we joined together in prayer and covenant and prayed over him. Amen? He don't remember it because he was out. <laughs> Corn husker. That's what we call it. Corn husker. I just, you know, I mean, I mean, it's so simple, and yet people go, man, I, you know, I just, no, no, God, I mean, really, what I really do. You entrust your outcome to Jesus. This is what it says in Psalm 9 and 10. Psalm 9, 9 and 10. The Lord will also be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. If you're seeking God, quit worrying about your outcome. Just do what He says to do. Now that's important. Bill's testimony. Just do what He says to do. The other thing is obedience versus safety. We're trying to build this safe environment for our life. And I hate, I hate to tell you this, but God is kind of a scary guy, really. He's going to push you to do things and ask you to do things that are going to draw you up a little bit. I remember in the Chronicles of Narnia, which is a famous allegorical story about heaven and about Jesus. It's a kid's story, but it's got great depth to it. Written by C.S. Lewis. These kids discover a secret pathway in a closet that takes them into an alternative world. It types our passing into heaven. And they go into this alternative world and they have a guide and he's showing them around. And they turn a corner and there's this huge line there and they get scared and they jump back. And they turn to their God and they say, who is that? And the God says, that's Ashlyn. And Ashlyn is the type and shadow of Jesus Christ. That's Ashlyn. And they say, is he safe? Is he safe? Oh no, he's not safe, but he is the king. People come to Christ looking for that Oh, I don't want any, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have to do anything scary. You came to the wrong guy, hallelujah, amen, because he's going to ask you to step out in faith and do some things that are going to really, really test your faith. But if you will do what God has asked you, you know what you will find there? You're going to find peace. You're going to find peace. If you continue to walk in willful disobedience, you know what you find? Unrest and stress and anxiety and worry. But the minute you just do what God calls you to do. I had an Emmaus team meeting yesterday and I had to give a talk I hadn't given since 2008. This has been a crazy week around our house and I had no time to prepare. I had to go through and just make a few highlights and I'm up next to give my talk and I'm telling you what, I went before them in fear and trembling. And I said, God, I don't even remember half of this stuff and you're just going to have to take me through it and I'm just going to trust you because you put me here and you put me in this position. Thank you, God. 
Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> he knew that. <laughs> he said, are you going to trust me? Are you going to preach on it? Or are you going to walk it? Our God, I trust you. I went out and delivered this talk, man, and ministered to the guys. It was just, it was like I had the anointing on it. Because he needed me to get out of the way so he could just anoint it and do what he wanted to do. I don't even remember some things that I said. I got notes from that talk back and they said, man, that was so cool. And I go, man, I don't, did I say that? They got this. I gave me the wrong sheets. No, those are your sheets, your talk. I think that if we just do what God says and quit worrying about safety, come on, somebody. Because he is not safe, but he is the king. And whatever he asks us to do, he's going to see that we have a good outcome if we just be obedient. Amen. So to get peace, which surpasses all real rational understanding, you just got to you just got to trust God. And you got to meditate on things. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. Peace that makes no sense. It defies the circumstance. But we live in a time when people need peace. Here's how you get peace. You entrust your outcomes to Him and you get your heart in the right place because you have a, you have a pattern in your life of prayer and thankfulness. Thankfulness, Bill talked about. Aren't you thankful this morning? You know, I was praying and I heard the weather forecast and I went, God, I had this word prepared already. So, so this is show you what a lame brain I am. I, I had this, gotten this word already and I go, God, does it have to be on Sunday? I mean, you know, really, nobody comes, God. They don't like to drive on the bad roads, and it kills our offering. And, you know, can we, hey, let's let it snow on Monday, and they can stay home from work. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sister Lonnie goes, amen. We got to work in agreement. We're two more agreed, so she'll be done for them. And the Lord said, it snows on Sunday because aren't you the church of the healing vision? Isn't that the vision that you've taken to the whole country? Didn't you bring me an offering? Didn't, didn't you get the other churches together? And didn't, didn't y'all come together in agreement over the healing vision? Then I want it to snow on Sunday to validate. Those guys prayed and they believed and it's still happening. And I go, that's great, God, but what about the offering? He goes, Carol thinks it's really funny. He goes, are you going to trust me or not? Are you going to, are you going to preach on trust uh, and just so they, they have to trust me? Or are you going to trust me? Are you going to live it? Or are you just going to talk about it? Because the fruit that comes to your church through the breaking of the drought will far exceed any offering you can ever take up on a full house. You just got to trust me, God. You've done it so far. You're going to have to trust me. Because this weather pattern, I'm telling you, I know how it works. Every seven days. You watch. We're going to have a storm every seven days. So thank you all for coming. Hallelujah. <laughs> if you can't get a snow plow, I can call the state and beg them to plow this highway up here. And they're not going to plow it. Amen. I mean, it's just the way it is. So my point is, uh, I forget about And the Lord said, what about the ways that we bless you all this year? And, and it's so easy to forget about the blessing and think about the challenge. The problem is that doesn't solve the challenge. When you start worrying about the challenge, that doesn't make it any better. And if you just continue to thank God for the things that he's done, you feel your heart change and you have confidence and faith. You begin to meditate on those things. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on that. Think about what you're thinking about. What's in your mind? You know, there's a lot of fear in America right now. Terrorism is stealing the Christmas spirit. People are so preoccupied with terrorists. And, and look, there's 14 families in California that have a legitimate reason to be. I, I, I'm not trying to belittle their, their grief. I'm not. I'm not trying to, 
to, to say that, that, that they shouldn't be grieved. They should be grieved. But here's my point. What other great things have happened in our life this past year? We have one event that happened in Santa Barbara, California, and it was terrible, and I hate it. And we all do, and we prayed and pray for those families and so on and so forth. But we're focused on that one thing, and we've forgotten two dozen great things God has done in our community, in our family, in our church this year. Awesome things. Where is God? He's in heaven, and He's in here. What's He doing? He's working. He's working. Grace signed off, went to the army, going to get married December 27th. You better call me and remind me. I'll forget. And I'm and I'm I'm missing. I'm going. She's got two. She's got two sons. Her and Scott got two boys in the military. And if you've got children and uh, kids in the military now, you know you've got to be really, really, really on edge sometimes. But what you have to stand on is God's promise to take care, to protect, to provide, to be there so that the peace of God, you know what it says in Isaiah, it says that he whose mind is stayed on the Lord has peace on his heart. If your mind's going to be stayed on the terrorist, you ain't going to have peace in your heart. If your mind is stayed on the Lord, you have a peace, an assurance, an understanding that everything is going to be okay. I, I, it was at, I was at this meeting in Aberdathy yesterday, and there's a bunch of guys there from the oil fields. I mean, a bunch of those guys working the oil fields. And I'm telling you what now, they're facing adversity. Their, their jobs, they're looking, at, they're looking at losing their jobs. That one of them asked me, he said, Pastor, what would you do? I said, I'll tell you what I would do. I'd start looking for some opportunity. Because wherever there's adversity, God makes opportunity for his people. I said, you need to start looking around. You might want to bid on one of them oil wells. He goes, are you kidding me? I said, hey, oil gets much cheaper. They might give it to you. Hell, there it is. <laughs> start looking for opportunity in adversity. And looking for a door God's trying to open. And be anxious for nothing and trust him. And you're going to have a great Christmas. It's a season where we focus on the love of Jesus. And I'm not letting the devil steal the Christmas season because of some stinking terrorists, hallelujah. I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell the world right now, I'm telling you that Jesus Christ is the reason for the season and he's the answer for everything that we face. And the minute that we trust him and him alone and put our faith in him and quit, not put our faith in Republicans or Democrats or independents or whatever they are, and put our faith in Jesus Christ as a nation. When we do that again, and I'm telling you, we are, and that we're, the church is starting to rise up in America. And when the nation turns to Jesus, you're going to see our problems just dissipate like wax. There's going to be some scary events ahead in the Middle East. We know that by prophecy. They're not going to scare us none because we're in a kingdom that can't be shaken. I'm not being philosophical, people. I've been through some really tough times when I had to trust God for everything. And here's what I'm here to tell you. Those that seek the Lord, He never lets them down. He never lets them down. You believe that? Say amen. Amen. This is a season we need to be really thankful for the cross because that's what's going to get us through. The covenant with Him is what's going to get us through.